All right. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on Farm to School Canada Digs In and the impacts of the Farm to School Canada Grants Program on Ontario. Uh, so it's super to have everyone here today. My name is Carolyn Webb. I work to coordinate Sustain Ontario's Edible Education Network. And um, then within the scope of this partnership, I work with Farm to Cafeteria Canada, and I'm the regional lead for Farm to School in Ontario. Um, and I'm located in Ottawa here today, so I'll be moderating the webinar today. The purpose of the webinar is to report on the evaluation of Farm to Cafeteria Canada's Farm to School Canada Digs In initiative, which included the Farm to School Ga uh, Canada Grants Program. And the grant program has led 40 elementary schools, now 40 elementary and high schools in um, Ontario to receive up to $10,000 to establish a Farm to School Salad Bar program at their school. And so then over the next hour, uh, Jesse and I will be sharing some of the impacts of the initiative, as well as some next steps that we're looking to move forward. And then we'll open it up for about uh, 20 minutes of Q&A and discussion. So at any point during the presentation, you're welcome to share a question in the question box. Uh, and then we can address those questions during the final discussion um, period. You can also raise your little virtual hand at the end if you'd like to be unmuted and ask the question yourself. So I'll refer to that when it's time. Um, I should just share that the webinar will be recorded. We've had a number of people express that they're really keen to see it, but just can't make this time because they have to pick up their kids or um, other uh, matters. And so we'll be sharing the link with everybody afterwards once we post it. Uh, likely tomorrow we can share it. Um, so with that, I think I'll just end my brief intro and pass it over to Jesse Veenstra, Director of Farm to Cafeteria Canada, to, to share more and get us started. And I'll share some stories later on. So thanks. Over to you, Jesse. Thank you, Carolyn, um, for the great introduction. And thanks, everybody, for, for joining us now or in the future, if you're watching your recording. Um, as we get started, I just wanted to invite folks um, Sorry, there we go, advance my slides. I just wanted to invite folks to introduce yourselves in uh, the chat box and feel free to share as much or as little um, about yourself, um, your name, your location. Um, in doing so, I also invite you to share um, a land acknowledgement. You know, we have folks joining from all over. Uh, myself, I'm joining from uh, the traditional lands of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. Um, and I, also known as Vancouver, British Columbia. And I share this just to think about, um, as we talk about food and um, this work that we do in terms of accessing um, the land and the waters, um, just really to think about um, the role that we play in our food systems and we know that right now um, of course a lot of inequities and vulnerabilities of our food system are really being brought to the fore so please feel free to share your land acknowledgement um, and if you're not sure what that is um, Carolyn's going to share a link to um, a site where you can uh, look up your location and find out what your traditional land acknowledgement is so she'll type that in the chat um, and then for a fun introduction, because it is the fall harvest season, uh, feel free to share a, a favorite seasonal and, and vegetable that you're enjoying right now. Um, and I think here, whoops, sorry about that. For myself, I think here in BC is probably carrots. I have a massive bag of carrots in my uh, fridge right now and they're uh, from the market and they're they're going in just about everything right now. Okay, hello. So while everybody is introducing themselves, I'm just going to um, move on to talk a little bit about the purpose of this presentation. As Carolyn mentioned, um, we are celebrating the impacts of Farm to School Canada Digs In initiative. I'm going to walk through a little bit um, of detail about that program. Um, but we're also celebrating Farm to School Month. So October every year is Farm to School Month and it's an opportunity to kind of share the great work that's happening in the Farm to School realm across the country. Um, and so three years ago, actually, this month, we kicked off the Farm to School Canada Digs In initiative. So it's coming full circle, and we're excited to share with you um, some of the impacts, um, which are the results of the first comprehensive evaluation of a national Farm to School program in Canada. So we're really excited about that. Um, and also to grow the, the movement um, and folks' networks to connect with one another. That's a big part of Farm to School 
um, month and the movement in general is just to be able to facilitate connections with all of the great folks um, working in this space um, across the country. So hopefully, even if virtually you can uh, maybe meet somebody new or uh, make a connection, perhaps you're new to Sustain Ontario or new to Farm to Cafeteria Canada even. So I'm going to talk about, as we move through this, a little bit about planting the seed, the idea of, of what Farm to School is and what it means for this initiative and how that's grown over the last number of years. Um, a big part of that is through knowledge sharing and capacity building. And as I mentioned, evaluation. So we'll talk a bit about the, um, the feedback that we've heard through this initiative um, and what next steps look like for Farm to School. Um, in Canada, and then we'll leave some time for, for question and answer. Oops, sorry, I'm not sure why I'm, I keep having trouble with my slides. Um, so first of all, I want to talk a little bit about the concept of farm to school. So many of you on the line might be very familiar, um, others it might be newer for you, but we often refer to the idea of the farm to school approach a lot. And so when we talk about that, we're referring to this diagram here, um, which really has um, three core elements and they serve to create this integrated approach to farm, or sorry, to school food. And so the first piece of that being hands-on learning. So providing opportunities for students to um, learn whether it's core curriculum or other skills like um, cooking and gardening, um, through uh, access to food and land um, at school and through their learning experiences. The other piece is actually serving healthy local food in school, so giving students that full sensory experience to see and taste and touch food, and that might be through um, a snack program, it could be through um, like this initiative, the farm to school lunch um, through a salad bar. And then the last really important piece of the puzzle is school and community connectedness. So the partnerships and the connections with local farmers and other regional food producers, um, NGOs and a host of, of different stakeholders working in this space um, that really help to kind of bring, bring initiatives um, to life. And so with this and the Canada Digs In movement, we're looking to grow this concept across the country. So over the last three years, um, we've worked to implement grants uh, in schools across five provinces, uh, British Columbia, Ontario, Quebec, um, Newfoundland, New Brunswick, I think, and Ontario, of course, I'm like, I skipped over one, sorry. Um, and then to build capacity. And so we'll talk a little bit about what those activities looked like. And then, as I mentioned earlier, to evaluate um, these initiatives, um, which has been really important because we have a lot of evidence of farm to school um, in the United States, but not in the unique context of, of what those impacts look like in Canada. So this initiative, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge our partners. It really has been very much rooted in partnership with uh, 11 uh, key organizations, uh, including our, our um, national partners uh, with Public Health Agency of Canada, Whole Kids Foundation, who supports our um, grants that are, are provided to schools, and then of course our regional partners like Sustain Ontario, uh, who is our principal partner organization in the province, um, and Carolyn, of course, I'm sure many of you know well, um, really being that key point of contact in the region to help connect schools to different resources, um, subject matter experts, and to one another. So just a, a brief overview of participants in this initiative and, and where they took place. I mentioned the five provinces, which you can see here. And so through our Canada Digs In um, initiative and our grants program, we were able to provide almost $940,000 in grants directly to K-12 schools across the provinces. Um, and we also um, had initiatives running with through our car campus partner, Neil Exchange, um, at a number of campuses as well. So in total, this reached um, 56,000 students, 35,000 of which um, were in the K-12 sector. Um, and I also just want to note on this, this is in context of this particular project. So we know there's so much more great um, farm to school work happening across the country in every province and territory. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that. And 
Uh, for those that are unfamiliar, we do host a farm to school map on the Farms Cafeteria Canada website and currently there's about a little over 1230 schools that are registered on there and so um, if you represent a school and you're not on there um, and you're participating in any farm to school activity, I encourage you to, um, to check it out and to register your school's activity on there. And what the initiative looked like in Ontario. So um, the participating schools, uh, the 86 schools from the previous slide, um, represent two cohorts of grantees from 2016 to 2018. Um, and, or sorry, that onboarded in 2016 and 2018. So their grant um, cycles having just finished this past June in 2020. Um, and so Ontario was actually one of the first provinces um, that started in 2016. So they have a large proportion of uh, the number of schools, which is fantastic. So 32 schools of the 86 um, that participated in this initiative were located in Ontario. Um, and excited to, to also share, and we'll chat a little bit about this later on, but um, we have an additional eight schools that have just onboarded as part of the 2020 grants that we've just awarded. So what do the grants programs look like? Um, really, this is the core of the Canada Digs In initiative I mentioned earlier, um, grants of up to $10,000 that are supported by Whole Kids Foundation as our core partner in this. Um, and really those funds are for schools to implement comprehensive farm to school programs uh, based around a salad bar model. And so to deliver that schools all develop diverse teams um, made up of folks from both the school community and broader community, um, including community partners, uh, sometimes farmers, it really varies depending on the school um, and what works best for their needs and their goals. Um, all of the schools work to learn and kind of grow their own capacity by attending a variety of training um, access to resources and um, learn to participate and promote their participation rather uh, both among students and families um, and really to develop this this meal service for schools which we'll see as we go on that provides students with such an enriching opportunity to um, to not only enjoy a healthy uh, local meal through a salad bar, but also to be engaged in the planning preparation service of, of that salad bar um, and really integrating those experiential learning experience. So to help uh, support schools along their journey in this work, um, the through the initiative, we're able to provide a variety of resources. Um, webinars not unlike this one, um, as well as access to regional training and a variety of resources um, both developed through our um, through Farm to Cafeteria Canada and our partners and also um, other folks that are doing great work in this space. And so um, some of these I'll just mention as well. So some of these slides are actually screen captures of an interactive report that we've recently released um, that some of you may have had an opportunity to see. Um, I'll provide a link to it in a few slides, but through that report, you can actually access some of these materials. So if you're interested to learn more, um, you can navigate to them through that report. With respect to kind of knowledge sharing and capacity building activities offered through the initiative, I mentioned that right now it is Farm to School Month and, and really it's just an opportunity to share all the great work um, that's happening in this space, not only with grant recipient schools, but as I mentioned, so many folks leading really great work um, to be able to connect students to their food and the land and water it comes from. Um, so October is always a really fun time of year where folks can kind of share the different creative and innovative things that they're, um, that they're doing. And, and we get to see so many great photos um, of people really kind of digging into farm to school. Um, another piece which has been really exciting uh, milestone in this particular initiative is we've been able to host a number of um, in-person opportunities, remember when that was a thing, um, which has been really fantastic, um, including our national conference that took place in um, May of 2019 um, as the first farm to school conference in Canada. And so through that, uh, we invited a variety of practitioners from 
um, teachers, um, academics, folks working in public health, uh, and even students um, to the conference, which was held in Victoria, BC. And so this photo here is actually from one of the workshops that we offered because this work is really about um, providing students with access to hands-on learning, but also growing the capacity of um, for those folks that are really the champions and, and community and school members that are leading this work on the ground. Um, so we had a, a six field trips. This one is from um, an opportunity to actually, if anybody's familiar, just outside of Victoria, a community called Souk. Um, so we were able to do both an ocean and forest walk through a, a foraging field trip and, uh, and visit a nearby school um, that has some great work happening there. Um, another piece just to comment um, with respect to the conference is really this opportunity for a lot of just knowledge exchange and we we talked about this conference as being a different kind of experience and the photos you see represented here. Um, we had a lot of circles and just sharing um, and it was really participatory and I think that's one of the things that's been so lovely about the farm to school movement. Um, and, and I think just creating these open spaces for sharing and, and knowledge exchange and different people working in this space. Um, and the photo on the right, I'll just point out to uh, the gentleman in the gray shirt, his name is Stuart Murray. He is a teacher from one of our grant recipient schools in New Brunswick. Um, and the two gentlemen on the side of him are two grade seven students who um, are participate in an alternate program at their school. Um, that actually grows produce for service in their salad bar that their um, that their food service provider purchases and serves in, in their meals. So they had come all the way from New Brunswick for their first time on a plane uh, to share their experience. And I'm just going to skip over it, some more from the conference. Um, so now that we've talked a little bit about um, what the grants are in this initiative, um, opportunities for capacity building. I mentioned earlier, we really want to get a better understanding of what are the impacts of this. And so we we're very fortunate to be able to conduct a robust evaluation over the last number um, of years, starting in 2017, and just wrapped up this past spring. And so I'm going to quickly cover some of the key um, outcome areas um, that we were able to see through this initiative, and then we'll, we'll share um, some stories from schools. Uh, so the first being public health. Um, so we know that students are gaining the skills and knowledge um, for a lifetime of healthy eating and that they're actually eating um, healthier food. Schools are reporting schools that students are eating healthy food at school. Um, and this photo is, we have so many great photos. It's one of the best parts of my job. Um, but I, this is one of my favorite um, sort of before and after photos of students. And I think not, just because it's a great picture, but I love the, the top picture because I think it really illustrates the element of choice of, of um, farm to school and the salad bar. So we encourage that students have an opportunity to choose what's on their plate. And so you can see in these two little boys plates, they look very different. Um, and then also they're subsequently very empty. And we often hear students going back for seconds as well. And so being able to provide students with that that agency to choose, um, you know, if, if they want to eat a lot of carrots and tomatoes, um, then they can do that. Um, yeah, so one of the great things about this. The next impact area is education and learning. Uh, so really farm to school is so great for bringing curriculum to life, whether it's, you know, collaborating to uh, make a recipe together or working in the garden. Uh, we know that students are learning core skills, whether it's math or science um, and, and geography. There's so many opportunities to, to teach through farm to school. Um, and we also know that students are actually learning about the food system. So understanding where their food is coming from um, and then just the life skills that come along with that. So cooking and eating, or sorry, cooking, gardening, growing. The third impact area is community economic development. Uh, so connecting schools to local farmers and to other um, local food providers and folks across is really the value chain in the local food system. And we know that um, schools are actually reporting that they, they feel they're leaders in their communities. And we hear stories of, of schools and regions mentoring other schools 
um, to be able to begin this work and kind of navigate how to procure local food um, for service in, in their schools. And the fourth area that I'll touch on is vibrant school communities. And I think probably what I hear the most or resonates really um, so much through these programs beyond kind of all of the other benefits is really how they shape the culture of the school environment. And so um, this is a photo from Mark Arno Collegiate in Toronto. Um, and we actually have um, a little excerpt from a creative writing story um, that one of their students wrote about their experience with the salad bar. And so I'm just gonna give everyone a moment to read that because it really speaks for itself. And with that, um, it covers the, the key impact areas that I'm going to talk about. Um, but I'm going to pass it over to Carolyn to share a, a couple of school stories because I think they really um, articulate these impacts uh, and bring them to life so well. So over to you, Carolyn. Thanks, Jesse. Yeah, as you said, it's often the stories that really bring things to life. And I kind of like to share stories from all of our grantees. but. Um, I'll leave it at two for today, one elementary school and a high school. So the first that I'll share about is Sir Guy Carleton Secondary School. And so um, they're a high school um, where I'm located actually in Ottawa. Uh, they specialize in vocational education and they have a number of specialist high skills majors. So Chism, Chism programs, including hospitality and tourism and green industries. Um, and many uh, students there are there to build skills in the trades. So before they received their grant, they'd been they'd established a large greenhouse, and you can see the the picture there, and the video is available on their website and also on the Farm to Cafeteria Canada website, um, showing you know their aquaponics system, and um, they can produce 400 heads of lettuce at a time. It's quite the amazing um, creation. Uh, the school um, before uh, they were working with Farm to with uh, before this grant, um, they had done a lot to grow herbs and greens that they were selling to local restaurants in an activity um, teaching their students entrepreneurship skills. Um, and the big industrial kitchen has uh, let the school produce food for their school's breakfast and lunch programs. So they already had a really great basis. But what they weren't doing is growing food and serving it to their students and eating it themselves. And so that was really the basis for their application for the Farm to Cafeteria Canada grant. And so when they applied, um, they received the grant in 2018 and um, it has let them buy a salad bar unit. You can see it there with um, their lead uh, chef and um, develop a model where they could get the food um, that they produce into their breakfast and lunch programs um, so that their students can eat it and enjoy it. And uh, it's also helped um, where they've made more relationships with local farmers, um, purchased more local produce, and really kind of engaged the, the school in their broader community. Um, so thanks to the grant and other financial partners, um, the Ottawa Carleton District School Board, um, the school has since um, built a large 32 bed outdoor garden and purchased tower gardens to increase the production um, for service in the cafeteria. Uh, and so it's really helped them kind of they've done a, they did a lot before the grant and then the grant this grant really helps them kind of advance the work and and do even more in a ripple effect um, where their students are now really living kind of the farm to school journey of production harvesting um, consumption and serving and uh, looking at the whole food system so i think i will um let jesse go to the next slide where we've captured a video of derek brez um, one of the lead teachers on this initiative sharing the impacts of the program because um, can't say it any better than, uh, than, yeah, he's the one to really tell his story. So you can just hit play, Jesse. Can you take a second to look? Yeah. No, okay. sorry. But it should come. So our farm to cap experiences have actually had quite a huge impact on our school. Uh, the first is it's really allowed us to make some cross-curricular connections um, between specifically our green industries and our culinary arts, um, the, the farmers and the chefs, uh, and bringing them together to talk about you know, what meals can look like, what we're doing to help out each other. Uh, so it was kind of a, a, 
great opportunity to take two existing programs that have been really well established for 30 plus years and, and to bring them closer together for some really meaningful discussion. Um, in terms of you know these stories that go on, our inaugural salad bar, 120, 125 plus kids for free salad on the days that North America recalled romaine lettuce. And the best part is we didn't have to worry because we had grown it ourselves. It had been picked by our urban farming kids. It had been sent down to the cafeteria, prepped by our culinary art kids, and showed up on the salad bar. To us, that was a real great way to start this up. Like, look, we can make this work. Um, even when the rest of the world was scared of lettuce, we can celebrate ours. So, so that was a big, big one. Um, as we're going to move into year three, our, our goal from year one uh, was to be able to provide a lunch program for our students. Uh, a free salad every day. If we can do it for breakfast, the building we're in with our facilities, we should be able to produce salad, free salad for kids at lunch. Um, so we can at least feed them twice a day with nourishing food. Uh, and, and that's still our goal, um, is to be able to provide that salad option. So as we move forward, it, it, we're going to start, you know, not only having salad bar, but having the daily salad option to see where we're at. And we couldn't do that without you know, the guidance of Farm to Calf Canada and, and this this wonderful journey we've been on. Um, probably the other story that really comes to mind is uh, we received a school board grant on top of our Farm to Calf, uh, probably because of our Farm to Calf model that we had developed through this, this funding. And we put in 32 new raised garden beds last year. And the question is, what do we do with it over the summer? And um, being a vocational high school, we serve the whole west end of Ottawa. So we don't have neighborhood kids. Well, probably 90% of our students are bused in. So uh, we have the staff who like connections with the local Boys and Girls Club. And they actually brought kids down from the Boys and Girls Club a couple times a week to help with watering and weeding. Um, and they were able to harvest food and take it back to the club to help the greater community. And to me, that was, that was a really awesome opportunity to make connections with the community. They took peas and they took beans and tomatoes and greens uh, back with them, not only for use at the club, but went home with families. And, and then we benefited. So we showed back up in September and we had potatoes and we had beets and we had carrots and we had more tomatoes and leeks. And we had all sorts of veggies that were ready to go uh, because of the help of the community. The students that came down from the club were not our students. Um, many of our students came from similar neighborhoods, but uh, it was their help that, that got us through the summer and we were able to help them back. So uh, developing that uh, reciprocal relationship was really huge. I really want to say thanks so much, Derek. Oh, just me, it's echoing. I'll try it again. Oh, that's still echoing. Um, you okay to advance the slide, Yeah. Great. Um, um, Jesse, are you okay to Jesse, you okay? So, our Oops. farm to cap experience is actually at the floor. Sorry. <laughs> cool. Uh, Thank you. Uh, yep, still echoing. Yeah, still echoing. It's echoing on my end? Yeah, can you try muting? Okay, I'll try again. Yeah, much better. Thanks. I don't know why that just started. Um, I yeah, I was gonna say I, I almost wanted to say thanks so much for that presentation, Derek, but um, he's not there. I did give him the heads up that we were gonna share his video, and we'll make that. It is um, gonna be available on the Farm to Cafeteria Canada website to share. I'll send it out the link to the video um, out uh, in case you want to reference it again. But um, but yeah, their their school just speaks to the power of the partnerships and the broad farm to school approach and how. Um, students can get so engaged in this work. So next I will share um, a story from Oakwood Public School. So they're a small um, school located in Oakville, uh, Ontario. And during the next video, I know that they're a bit choppy, but I just find that they give such a, a great representation of the school story um, right from the person. So um, with Oakwood, uh, Jesse, are you okay to go back to the Oakwood, to the previous slide? <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, Sheba can share in a little bit the um, the like the details about the school, but um, they've taken a really holistic approach um, to uh, how the farm to school program has been rolled out in their school as well. So they came into the grant partnership um, with Halton Food for Thought as a community partner, 
um, as well as a registered uh, dietitian, uh, no, a public health nurse who really helped them with developing the, the program and linking it with the school curriculum. So they grew a vegetable garden um, at first as their kind of getting started um, initiative, but then they started to have conversations about the need for sustainable food environments that support local farmers and that provide good healthy food for students. So they thought about how to do that and this grant opportunity came up, which they applied for. That was back in 2016 when they got the grant. So they were one of our, they were among our first round of uh, grantees. And so throughout the grant um, development, they've aimed to support education throughout the food system, um, growing, harvesting, tasting, eating, and everyone's been involved in different activities and they were excited by the, the healthy food and they're really connected it back to the curriculum. And I'm gonna just show um, a presentation that Shiva had given on a previous webinar of how uh, they were, they are linking um, their program to the curriculum. And so what you see on your screen is the Ontario Foundations for a Healthy School. It's um, guidance from the Ontario Ministry of Education and it's used uh, both around um, just within a school environment and then supported by public health. And so um, you'll see kind of little um, diagrams of how it matches all these elements. And so um, back there, the elements are, you know, curriculum teaching and learning then home, school, and community partnerships, school and physical environments. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, I will have to share that again. Um, school and classroom leadership and student engagement. Oh, sorry, I'm not sure what's happening there. Um, so then back to their school journey. Um, they, again, began with a vegetable garden and then um, they received their grant. And so one of the first things that they did there was during their Meet the Teacher Night, they uh, presented their salad bar at the Meet the Teacher Night to just expose parents to um, the salad bar offerings and the, the variety of, um, actually, it doesn't look like they had even gotten their salad bar unit at that time, that they were just serving it kind of in a display like they would, but they, um, they offered it to get some of that parent buy-in. In October, they ran a Great Big Crunch. It's often um, rolled out in March, but often the Great Big Crunch is used as a fall activity. And so as a school, they all crunched into Ontario apples along with others in their region. That was an initiative led by Health and Food for Thought. And so that raised the awareness of local food and healthy food and um, built a lot of the excitement at the school. They had guest speakers in and so um, here was one guest speaker who uh, was um, showing kind of what uh, living things need and um, engaging the students in planting gardens. They also did a uh, food, a film screening about where our food comes from um, to engage families and link it with the curriculum more so. Um, March was zero food. Um, they, they led a zero food waste event and workshop about how food systems work. Um, again, bringing in families and tying it to the curriculum. And so that by the time they launched their salad bar in April, um, the whole school community had really built up a lot of uh, the food literacy understanding and engagement in healthy food. And they were ready to kind of celebrate um, the offerings of the salad bar. They also had a farmer come in. They, they have said that's not their farmer, but, um, but yeah, farmer visit and then led um, on to many other initiatives. Uh, so I will let Jesse put the slides back up. Thanks, Jesse. And um, they, uh, yeah, so the big thing is that by the salad, time the salad bar was launched, they had taught about how and where food comes from, how it impacts their health and their family's health and the health of the environment. They had done a lot of curriculum links. They had educated families. They had um, really looked at that kind of whole school environment and addressed um, those foundations within the Ontario framework. Um, so it, they saw it ripple throughout the rest of the school. The Healthy School Club planted vegetables in bucket gardens. One class tried out vermicomposting. Many teachers worked with the salad bar kitchen coordinator to integrate food skills into the classroom learning, like blending hummus. Um, other schools have been more interested in modeling the program, so it's even kind of rippled on to other schools. And um, I know uh, some of the earlier numbers that they had were by 2017-18, so a year and a bit into their program. They had up to 120 um, salad bar orders um, at a school of 220, so that was over 50%, and I think it just continued to grow from there. Um, for, they ran it about 20 weeks of the school year and, uh, and have seen growth now. 
we all know that this year is quite different. And um, and these videos were taken during the summer when you know there was uncertainty about what the the year was bring would bring. But um, I do know that schools are are really trying to figure out how to make it um, work in the the years of, ahead and and try to at least enhance those food literacy um, concepts, even if some of the salivar elements aren't possible. But I'll let uh, Sheba speak to the impacts of the program on Oakwood Public School just as a, a quick little video. So I can't hear it now, Jesse. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not sure why it's not playing now. No worries. We're laying, layering all sorts of technology elements here. Um, there we go. So, um, Oakwood is located in Oakwood, which is one of, which is rated as number one place to live in Canada by Madison's Magazine. We are a small school the student body of 25, but the school location is interesting. We are located in a community where the social risk test is higher than the rest of all time. And uh, it's going, it's a double gentrification, it's affecting the dynamics of the school community. Um, in this, so in, in terms of all these dynamics, the cerebral program has been a huge, has been a huge, has made a huge impact in the school in terms of students because most of these students are coming from different socioeconomic statuses and they have they have they have challenges uh, having um, having reach to uh, fresh bodies uh, on a regular basis. An example of an expanding community outreach would be the whole foods of Dario chose Oakwood School as one of their uh, community partners for the community support day. So they noticed our salad bar program and the healthy schools initiative on our school website. And they chose us for the donations, which helped us buy more local foods um, because the local foods, um, the fresh produce fish is very expensive, so it helped us mitigate those costs. We were able to buy a uh, healthy beef kitchen with spiralizer and slice of flash foods. Um, we were able to buy cheese. So, this is one huge that I can big impact that the FBS program is being now. Thanks so much, Jesse. Well, I'm done with the stories, and so I'll pass it back to you, Jesse, to share um, the rest of the impacts that we've seen. Yeah, so I just want to um, speak to kind of the last part, and thank you, Carolyn, for, for that. Um, I think the stories are so important to kind of um, really showcase what these programs look like, and um, they're so different at every school. And um, one of the reasons that that's the case is just the diverse partners um, that are participating. And so one of the things, or I guess the, the last but not least part of the evaluation of this work that we looked at, I mentioned earlier that it was a partnership um, of multiple organizations, um, mostly at the national and provincial level. And so we did look at um, those partnerships and evaluating sort of the role that they play. Um, but I think an opportunity for future exploration is really those partnerships at the regional and local level. Um, they're so important um, to this work and I think they really drive so many um, fantastic opportunities and, and really kind of make the programs shine as we see um, just kind of the ripple effect that it has, you know, Derek talks about the different opportunities for partnering with the local Boys and Girls Club. Um, and so, yeah, I can't say enough about just the role and the value of partners in this work. So that concludes kind of the, the chat about our impacts from this initiative, as I mentioned earlier, and um, Carolyn's shared in the chat. Um, this is what the online interactive report looks like. If you haven't seen it, you can access it at the URL there, um, which is also in the chat. Um, and if you'd like to hear more about the impacts on the different sectoral areas, um, if you scroll to the evaluation section of that report, there is a series of info sheets that look like this. 
Um, and you can learn more about the impacts of those individual areas. And, and there's also um, a fact sheet for Ontario um, as well. So just quickly before we move to Q&A, um, next steps, I mentioned that we have eight new grant recipients in Ontario that are just starting their journey. Um, we're really excited to actually have 34 new grant recipients across the country. So including adding four more provinces as well as one school in Nunavut. Um, and so while this year does look very different, we know there really is continued appetite and in many cases more than ever um, to be able to provide students with the opportunity to access healthy local food at school and to really learn about and understand their food systems. Um, and so we are embarking on that work. Um, oops, sorry, Nova Scotia. <laughs> There's Nova Scotia popping up there. Um, and then the other piece that I just want to kind of set into context as we continue to grow. So these capacity or the Farm School Canada grants that we've been chatting about um, through this initiative, they really sort of fit in the center of this diagram as a capacity building. Um, and we think about sort of the, the tier of grants that Farm to Cafeteria Canada offers um, as increasing capacity building because we do want to um, grow school's ability to deliver and sustain this work. And so um, the next sort of phase and that we're starting to see naturally really emerge is this idea of the learning circles where multiple schools in a region are working together um, over the course of 18 to 24 months um, on a common challenge um, that's transforming sort of the school food system, not only for their, um, for their school, but for their community. And those are supported by um, a coordinator that helps to facilitate um, that process with not only schools, but multiple um, community stakeholders. So that's just a bit of a window into sort of the growth of, of the farm to school movement and the different points that schools can kind of um, either start or plug into their, their journey. And finally, I just wanna make a note about our evaluation framework. So we're really excited to have completed this initiative and have some preliminary impacts around Farm to School in Canada, but we know that we're just starting to scratch the surface. And so we're excited to be leading um, the development of an evaluation framework for Farm to School in Canada. And I'm gonna pass it over to Carolyn to talk a little bit about that process and how um, you can get involved. Thanks, Jesse. So many of you have been getting my emails and others haven't, but uh, yeah, this evaluation framework is being launched to really try to figure out outcomes and indicators that we all want to measure around farm to school. Um, the hope is that by the time um, this process is complete, we will have those again, outcomes and indicators and be able to use them to articulate how to measure farm to school where we can um, work with academic partners to, um, or government partners even, to um, establish some protocols or tools to, um, to measure important um, outcomes and indicators that we'd like to see measured around the four um, specific spheres, public health, community economic development, education and learning, and um, environment. Um, and also be able to launch into some um, training webinars, perhaps on evaluation, toolkit development, and uh, really try to figure out how to support schools and researchers in successfully evaluating the impacts of, um, of all of these um, aspects of uh, student well-being and increased business and income for local producers and um, just um, access to healthy food, consumption of healthy food. We, we hear about so many benefits and we've measured a number through this initiative, but um, this framework really lays the foundation for the language for kind of future measurement and work and training and, and all of that. So um, the first two rounds of surveys have gone out. It's been using a modified Delphi method where we've uh, proposed some indicator or some outcomes and asked for feedback and revised them and put them out and asked for feedback. And then we're in the stage of revising the round two data. But if you're interested in joining a virtual conversation, um, they'll be held uh, on November 19th, 26th, December 1st, and December 8th. And I can send more info in the follow-up email where I uh, share the recording from this session. So that's that. Excellent, thanks, Carolyn. Um, and with that, we're gonna open it up and see we've got a few questions already coming into the chat box. 
Um, so I'll start to address that. Um, so how are schools adapting the salad bar concept with COVID um, and with physical distancing and sanitization? Is, that is the million dollar question. Um, and I would say it really varies. It's been, um, it's quite different, not only across the country, but we're hearing even um, within um, regions and sometimes right down to the school level. Um, so guidelines are different, a little bit different in every province, a little bit different in every school district. Um, or, or sort of the interpretation of those guidelines is different in every school different district. But we know that some schools are uh, making it work. So we recently held a webinar um, talking about a couple of different examples. Um, the salad bar itself, there's, so first of all, in some cases where they're able to serve the salad bar, um, it's not necessarily self-serve, um, but folks are able to serve it um, and students can still choose what goes on their plate. Um, but it's being served by either a, a school food service worker or, or parent or volunteer, depending on the context of the school. Other settings are not quite there. The salad bar is not up and running, but they're figuring out other creative ways. So um, one particular school we've heard of is rather than serving the salad bar every, um, every week for the whole school, um, they have it, they're serving it by cohorts. So every cohort of students gets their chance at the salad bar. So it's a reduced sort of number of um, exposures and, and times that students get to eat from it, but they're still getting the opportunity to do that. Um, and then in other cases, um, schools are, are doing sort of a menu of, of packaged salads where you can add your own um, dressing, things like that. Um, so there are definitely different creative ways. Um, we're very early stages still in, in understanding how we can support schools to adapt, but we know there, there definitely is a strong appetite for it. Thanks, Jesse. I can just add that um, there are a number of ideas that people are playing around with that include uh, outdoor kitchens. Um, I've heard of some organizations investing in that and just trying to figure out how to, um, yeah, create outdoor spaces for more learning, um, as Jesse said, you know, cooking opportunities within the classrooms where it's not available to the entire school. Uh, some we've heard of a school who is kind of preparing items that they're then selling to teachers as like package market um, items, uh, just as a, an initial step to get the ball rolling. Um, and then um, there certainly seems to be kind of an interest, at least for the new grantees of you know, can we start with many of the food literacy elements, even if we can't be serving salad right now? Can we be like Oakwood um, Public School? Can we be laying the foundation for that energy and interest um, once we're able to serve salad again? Um, and uh, yeah, and yeah, trying to perhaps get um, guest speakers in by Zoom. There's a, a big opportunity for the um, virtual community as well at this time. Um, and so just, we've heard a lot of creative thinking and uh, done a lot of creative thinking with people to try to figure out what some great opportunities are right now. But, uh, but it's been pretty inspiring just hearing what, what folks are kind of coming up with and ways to make this work within the spirit of Farm to School. Yeah. You good to take on the next one, Jesse? Yeah, sure. So next question, have schools used hydroponic growing mediums? Uh, have they tried dehydrating or using fermentation to preserve uh, fruits and veggies? And I would say um, the short answer across the board is yes, yes, and yes. Um, so every school really has the opportunity to um, sort of choose their own adventure in terms of the types of um, growing and, and preparation and serving that they do. So many schools actually do hydroponic growing, whether it's through um, grow towers or other um, more robust systems, just depending on, on the school. Um, it doesn't work for every school, but a lot of schools find it really helpful. Um, the, with respect to preparing, um, I think it's, it's very much sort of um, driven by the local community. So in many regions, um, dehydration, and um, preserving, we hear of schools. Um, that's actually, a, a, it's a great way to be able to serve produce um, in the winter months um, because it's of course 
challenging with the school year doesn't always coincide so well with when um, local food is available, but um, different preservation methods are a great way to be able to serve um, local foods and also incorporate food literacy um, in sort of the, in teaching those, those preservation methods, so yeah. Yeah, I can add to the say, absolutely. There are a lot of schools um, buying the hydroponic growing towers and others um, looking at indoor soil-based growing towers. Um, and on the food preservation side, um, I even saw Sir Guy actually uh, here in Ottawa, I went to, um, they featured a whole lot of their farm to school elements at their, again, at the meet the teacher night, it seems to be a bit of a theme, a great opportunity to, to show what the school is doing to, to parents. And um, they had preserved a number of, uh, I think they did fire roasted tomatoes and some other variety of uh, tomatoes in, in canning. And they were selling those to families to kind of taste what the students had been producing and, uh, and just engaging everybody in the school community in that process. Um, so, so many different ways that folks are making it work. Thanks, Carolyn. All right, so yeah, next question is, is the evaluation mostly qualitative that was done? Yeah, so I, it's um, a mixed method evaluation. And so certainly a, a big part of it is qualitative because we um, we know so much of this work is, as we've even heard today, just sort of richly in the stories. Um, but through various surveys, there are qualitative uh, or quantitative, sorry, um, measures. So in terms of, um, you know, salad bar services, number of students being uh, involved um, even uh, sort of the the metrics around how much food is being served or how much local produce is being procured. Um, but the other piece that I would say, uh, which was really kind of an exciting element of this initiative, was the student food recall um, analysis that we conducted. So we called interviews with just over 500 students at a few schools in Ontario and um, BC to um, be able to actually conduct a nutrient analysis on um, food that they ate over a 24 hour period. And so that was a very robust um, process uh, that was quite um, quantitative in terms of the analysis. Great. Well, that's the last of our questions. It's time, if anybody really wants a question answered, you can, uh, you'll be first in line. Mm -hmm. Any questions? It can be about, again, and more about the evaluation or about students or about uh, future plans or the evaluation framework. I might even throw out a question for everybody in case you um, have a spare thought to think about it. Where are opportunities to expand work in, in Ontario? Like, How do we move forward on this even more? So you can ask a question of us or respond to that. We'll see if anybody wants to share. Not seeing anything. It's the end of the day. Might be time to wrap up. We're close to our ending. So um, yeah, I will say it was really fun to prepare this presentation. Just looking through all the, you'll see that most of the, the photos have little captions of Ontario schools. And just, it was really nice to do a recap of all the, the stories out there. And I can share the um, list of many other stories uh, that are available on the Farm to Cafeteria Canada website in, in case you'd like to reference them. And we have a question. Um, Curious about any thoughts on food sovereignty. Jesse, do you have an initial? Yeah, and I see there is a question that popped into the chat as well. So I'll just try to just briefly address both of them. So um, with respect to uh, food sovereignty, yeah, it is a great question. Um, and I think it's an area where we have an opportunity to do a lot of work. And so we are, um, and when I say to do a lot of work to figure out how we can best support and, and, and honor um, indigenous ways of knowing um, and really be allies in uh, food sovereignty. And so um, here uh, at Farm Cafeteria Canada, we've been doing some groundwork to um, be able to do hopefully some engagement around this topic. And so we're in the early planning stages of that. And so I would say um, please stay tuned because we, we do want to work and see how we can best 
support um, support and honor that. Um, I can also share that there are some great programs. Um, we do have a number of Indigenous schools uh, participating that are doing really great work and leadership um, around food sovereignty in particular, probably for the longest. I mentioned earlier the learning circles. So we have a number of schools uh, in Haida Gwaii here on the north of, north of BC um, that are, have been participating in a learning circle from about um, since about 2014, I think. Um, and so we can share a little bit of information about that and you can read about their story, um, maybe in the follow-up email here and we can include that. Um, and before, I don't want to lose track, I'm just going to answer the question about equity. Um, there was a question about equity analysis from Kristen um, in the evaluation. And so that, again, that's an area for great opportunity. And um, we did conduct dissemination area profiles um, as part of looking at where our schools, grant recipient schools were located. Um, unfortunately, there wasn't actually a, a lot of information that we could um, report on as a result of that, but it's very much um, on, on the forefront for, for future evaluation. One of the limitations with this particular evaluation was uh, around ethics, since we actually didn't collect a lot of individual information um, from, from students and the individual schools, but um, certainly in the area of opportunity. Thanks, Jesse. I won't add much more. Um, just in reflection to um, one of the comments made, yeah, um, comments was, seems like starting with youth is a great way to foster food sovereignty, and absolutely. Um, my perspective lately has been kind of coming from the building the evaluation framework and just hearing all the feedback coming in and um, a question that we put out for discussion and that will likely be addressed in maybe all of or maybe just the, the most um, relevant discussions, but how do we, you know, how do we integrate equity into our programs and measure that and make sure that we are um, reflecting that and holding ourselves accountable and, and, um, and again, yeah, what are appropriate indicators and ways to, to um, consider and reflect that in farm to school initiatives. Um, and the same with food sovereignty. I was just looking at uh, many different um, outcomes and indicators and thinking, you know, how to, how can we, um, reflect and measure um, this in our work. So I'll just reiterate that it, uh, it's a great opportunity where we can have more discussion and thinking and, um, and integrating it really into the heart of this work. It is at the heart of this work. And so how do we um, highlight that and just make sure to articulate it regularly? <laughs> so I don't see any more questions or comments um, other than comments saying that the photos are great, which is awesome. And uh, as I said, I will share the link to more of those stories and photos um, so that you can see all of them. But I think with that, I will draw our discussion to a close. Um, it was really exciting to be able to share the results of all of this work with everybody. We'll be sharing um, the recording by email. It would be fantastic if uh, you wanted to share it out more widely with anybody that you think would be interested in the results of this and also the online report. Um, you're welcome to reach out anytime. We look forward to continuing this conversation. And uh, yeah, I'm curious, Jesse, if you had anything else that you wanted to say? No, I just want to thank you, Carolyn, um, for co-hosting with me and really to everybody for taking the time to attend today or to view the recording. Um, we know there's so much Zoom in our lives right now. Um, so thank you for sharing your time with us.